there, folks. Um, Melissa Tebow here with the School of Science and Math, and uh, my colleague John Davis will Hi. be the uh, the featured event today for our uh, video conferencing and streaming professional development from NCSSM. This is uh, Scaling STEM, and the idea is that we are we at NCSSM have for years been finding ways to work to scale and to try to. Um, make more of the limited resources that we have available to us as every teacher does. So we're hoping to um, profile some of the work that we're doing and to invite applicants and uh, folks that are working in their schools and in their school systems as professional development providers, people that are um, just great teachers that have cool signature lessons to think about how they might share that through NCSSM because we all together are um, are going to try to improve math and science education for the state of North Carolina and beyond. So um, we have some folks that are watching this through a live stream. I will be monitoring the back channel so that if you click on the live chat and you post a question, I will make sure that John gets that question. And um, beyond that, I'm going to try to chime in if there's anything that um, I can speak to. But John's, uh, our, he has been teaching with us for years and will introduce himself and has been um, the primary on this particular presentation. All right. OK. All right. Very, very good. I'm John Davis. I'm a biology teacher here. I teach genetics and biotechnology and forensics. And I've also worked here in helping uh, build some of the earlier iterations of our statewide network uh, to share uh, science, math, technology, engineering um, uh, classes and skills to, to the great state of North Carolina. Uh, I'm also a former student of, school, of the School of Science and Math, so I have some experience of what was going on here in the 80s. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of science and math and, and how um, we're I think we're well poised to play an important role in scaling STEM statewide uh, and uh, what we've learned from 20 years of distance learning. So um, let's take a look at our presentation here. So it's uh, scaling STEM with the NCSSM, building capacity and improving outcomes uh, statewide. As you can see, science and math is here in Durham, North Carolina, and we see ourselves as, well, <coughs> um, uh, Build, helping to build a network for science and math education throughout the state, but it's a network that continues on uh, and we're just a, a small part of it. There are some really interesting local initiatives that I hope to highlight as well. So um, <clears throat> when we presented this uh, presentation at a in-person conference a few days ago um, with some uh, educators from around the state and from around the country, uh, we just posed an initial question. One of the things that we want to do is facilitate the distribution of really amazing lessons. We call them signature lessons. These are lessons that um, a teacher has been developing for years. You know that one or two that you have um, that you, I should say, that you've, um, you love to teach, maybe it fits a need, uh, and you've been developing for a while, and you, uh, if you've added enough to it to kind of make it your own intellectual property, in, the, in that way it would be perfect to share. So um, let's, I wonder if anyone would, is connecting in uh, from our chat. Uh, we asked the group there, do you have a signature lesson or to think about what a signature lesson is? Maybe at your own school, you know, um, you know the history teacher, there's one thing that he or she does really well. There's a, um, uh, the math teacher, one thing that he or she does really well, among many things, of course. Okay, um, and the folks at Pasquotank, if you guys, we're, we're in a live video conference with you, so if you want to jump in at any time and ask any questions, just bring yourself off mute and say hello. Gotcha. Okay. Really, should we ask the gentleman uh, who's here? <laughs> sure. Yes, Would you I'm like to introduce Juan yourself? I, yes, I'm Juan Choate. I teach Air Force Junior RTC. Oh, okay. Very good. Which we work with quite a bit uh, STEM. Uh huh. Uh, absolutely. Well, I have a couple of students who actually are at the school now as we speak. Oh, who came from the school here? So. Oh, that's interesting to to make that choice to move from ROTC to a school like ours, which doesn't have ROTC. But if they elect to go and do um, aeronautical engineering, uh, I think they may be well positioned to go into go into the Air Force Academy exactly. uh, from here. And so that's very uh, nice of you yeah. <laughs> to let them go, even though they wouldn't have the ROTC experience here because it was better for the students. So that will actually absolutely. We'll actually come back to that. 
And so um, with the ROTC curriculum, I'm not as uh, familiar with that as I'd like to be. So do you have, are there areas that of um, the curriculum that you have invented or created that were lacking or that you felt like you had something special to contribute to that that you've developed out yourself? No, actually, see, we have an aerospace science and our leadership as well as a health and wellness as well as drill and ceremonies and our leadership components. So we cover a wide spectrum, but again, from the STEM perspective, uh, this type of session is good for us because we get input and, and like I said, as I mentioned, we have students that are at the school now and students in the past that have left here and gone to the school, which we highly encourage them to do that uh, yeah. because of the nature of the school and what they're getting out of it. You know, whether they come back to us or not, uh, it's still a bonus for them. Awesome. So, and we, we're trying to get information, again, collectively across the state and, and actually see how we can apply that in our curriculum because we're right now we're an elective course, but we're also trying to implement a ground school certification course. So any feedback and input we can get across the board, uh, irregardless of the actual course itself, is good information for us, but the STEM in particular. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because Melissa just, uh, in our department, just received a grant recently and one come to us to, to roll out STEM education and we're, it's very early in the, in the process, but the, the fields were, you know, medical technology, agricultural technology, but there is one area in... Aeronautics and, and security. And so we'll Absolutely. be develop, we'll be doing, uh, uh, NCSSM will be instrumental in developing some curriculum around aeronautics and security and automation, so um, more in the mechanical engineering area. So Absolutely. that curriculum may be something that you can tap into and that your school might think about putting in maybe in ninth or 10th grade some courses that would be elective courses that would build capacity within your school for this type of study. So. And that's another reason for coming out to the session, the actual network portion of it, because there's right. things that we don't get to see, or when we do get to see them, they're already well on their way, but we're trying to get, you know, other programs that we can actually uh, marry up with ours, you know, across it, exactly. the Exactly. Because there's several, there's several Air Force Junior RTC units in the state of North Carolina, quite mm -hmm. a few to be exact. Matter of fact, I think we're no, probably the number two or number three state across the U.S. that have programs. Oh. So we're always looking for things new that we can take back to our headquarters uh, and then they can work that and you know meet all of the state requirements as well as what we require as well so and I wonder if we might be able to integrate some of that content as we begin to launch this new curriculum development project because the, we've been encouraged not to reinvent the wheel and if there is uh, significant curriculum materials in these areas that could be um, a part of that we may be able to look at your curriculum and then it's really working the network in both directions Definitely, definitely. We, we can talk all the <laughs> All right. Yeah, it sounds good. I mean, that, that sounds... Yeah, all right, yeah, thanks. absolutely. I mean, that's an exciting area to work in. I mean, I think as um, more automated, uh, you know, aircraft are designed, we'll absolutely. need to design um, aircraft that can use alternative fuels. You know, Virgin, uh, was it Virgin Atlantic ran a, ran a plane yes. for the first time on yes. biodiesel. So, you know, right. uh, there's going to be some exciting opportunities for growth for us. But anyway, okay, great. So um, let me tell you a little bit of a history for all the folks who are out there uh, tuning in about the history of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. Uh, we're housed in an old hospital. Uh, in uh, Durham, North Carolina. It used to be the old Watts Hospital. It was built around the turn of the century. Um, and um, whenever uh, the hospital staff moved up to Durham Regional, the hospital was kind of abandoned and it was uh, purchased by the state in 1980 and a lot of improvements have been made uh, since then. The school was founded right out of Governor's Hunt, Governor Hunt's office and it was the first statewide residential public high school specializing in science and math and actually a number of other states across the country. Uh, the Illinois schools, Louisiana school, there's one in Texas, South Carolina, um, built schools based on our model. and. Uh, um, uh, it, our school just uh, enables students to come from, uh, you know, all over the state uh, to one central place. And these are students that are highly motivated and talented in science and mathematics. And um, um, we're very fortunate to have them. And we're very fortunate that teacher leaders like yourself keep sending us some great students. So they have a good time when they're here. It's a residential environment, so it's kind of like going off to college a little bit earlier. I've got some pictures here of them showing some school spirit, and here's what the dorm rooms look like, and opportunities to do research on campus, off campus, at the, you know, in the local hospitals, in the re take advantage of the um, opportunities that are available in Research Triangle Park. 
we can, um, we're very fortunate because all the schools, the students are really talented and really motivated. You know, the courses can go pretty quickly and we can, and um, a lot of kids come to the school having already done like a little bit of calculus or, you know, having been in an accelerated science program. So we can offer some pretty um, unique courses that they can't find, you know, maybe at their own high school. Um, and, and these courses, um, there are places wherein faculty can innovate. They can develop new kinds of lessons and roll them out with a student population that's ready to take them. And so I call the NCSSM course catalog a crucible of, innova of innovation um, in content and pedagogy. Some of the courses that we have are math modeling with differential equations, structure and dynamics of modern networks like social networks or computer networks, um, understanding how they work, uh, climate change biology, looking at not only the mechanism of how you know increased CO2 and methane you know might be driving climate changes uh, over the next century or so, but how organisms are going to respond to that as well. Polymer chemistry, which could be anything from DNA to plastics, computational chemistry. This is you know using um, uh, supercomputers to model the interactions of, of complex three-dimensional molecules, astrophysics and cosmology, and then of course research courses where students get an opportunity to, to you know to pose a research question, to get, to get the resources to to um, answer it, to develop an experimental design, and maybe even publish uh, in a professional journal. So uh, we have a lot of good courses here, and of course. Um, we are very eager to share them and we have a history of sharing them. In fact, it's kind of, it's in our mission, really. And, and we feel that it's our responsibility. I mean, the, all the local communities throughout North Carolina, um, uh, they send us some of their top students, right? People who might be academic leaders in their own high schools. And, um, you know, even in this time of where you have lots of testing and, uh, you know, where the schools are being evaluated on how the students are doing, they will send us uh, their best students. And so, you know, we feel compelled uh, to give back. And some of the ways in the past, uh, the school's uh, about 25 to 30 years old, the ways we've given back in the first decade of the school are, you know, hosting uh, teach student workshops uh, on campus during the summer, uh, hosting teacher workshops where teachers can uh, kind of share the latest um, uh, techniques, tools and techniques in, um, in science math education. And also uh, some of our faculty here, as you can see, have even uh, written a uh, pre-cal book uh, that is, so we've written some, some innovative textbooks out there. But in the mid-90s, uh, we started leveraging the North Carolina Information Highway or using the North Carolina Information Highway and started sending out our outreach as, you know, bits of information. So via networks like the one that we're talking on right now. And so um, this started out with just us broadcasting some of our classes over cable television, uh, Time Warner Cable. You know, you'd be flipping through the channels and uh, there would be, you know, right next to ESPN or something, there would be the School of Science and Math and the teacher would be teaching. And I have, I have one friend who is from that era and uh, he tells me that he'll bump into, he would bump into people at the grocery store and say, oh yeah, I saw one of your psychology classes last night. I thought it was really cool. So, wow, talk about uh, being evaluated. <laughs> on your performance as a teacher. But anyway, so then we kind of migrated from that sort of one-way uh, cable t teaching via cable TV where then students had to fax their work in to um, using the internet and um, uh, uh, the North Carolina information, we'll use the internet to send assignments and the North Carolina information highway to, to have two-way video conferencing. And of course this is better because then you can see the students and you can see what they do and they can share their work through a document camera. Um, and it's a lot like just teaching in a conventional classroom except you're kind of looking through kind of what I call a little cloudy window. So we've worked on techniques to try to engage people uh, at a distance and that moved on or that's from there, we've moved on to offering not just synchronous courses via video conferencing, but courses that are even provided online with lots of asynchronous context where content where students can access at any time. And this includes things like uh, video physics demonstrations and phys virtual physics labs. And then we've since moved um, to try to develop uh, some apps so that students can uh, learn wherever they are, even riding the bus around, you know, from their their smartphone. So we're just trying to get our programs out there. And so here's this big family tree. I don't know if I'll go into a lot of great detail, but you know, we started out with the residential classes that led to summer workshops for teachers and teacher collaborations that we now conduct via video conference. We've also, as I said, caught, taught on cable TV and led to video conferencing and web conferencing. We have students doing, you know 
independent research and then our summer workshops they'll come and work with us. We've developed uh, content like textbooks that's become virtual labs that we're now kind of breaking up and, and distributing as learning objects. So this would be videos and animations and pictures that are all um, uh, kind of atomized so you can use them if you want in your class or if you want to tie them together into a big lesson we'll provide lesson plans as well as too. And so these virtual labs and learning objects enabled us to roll out NCSSM online and in rolling out NCSSM online a lot of our teachers have had to learn how to teach into a computer you know and capture that uh, capture that lesson and provide it in a way that it can be scaled and shared broadly and so this has led to uh, a wide use of blended learning uh, which is where you know you're basically your class is not uh, necessarily just um, how should I say you're, you're integrating asynchronous elements into your regular classes so and then the flipped classroom where the flipped classroom is where teachers who would normally say lecture um, and provide demonstrations during class and then give the kids homework to do uh, at night uh, they would actually uh, record some of those lectures and some of those demonstrations into a computer and then the students would watch those at night on their own time and then the class time could be then better used to do problem solving more labs or uh, working on specific issues in, in, in the students learning so uh, this is kind of a, a family tree that shows um, how we've been trying a bunch of different approaches and these approaches have been evolving into from one to another. I can't help it, I'm a biology teacher. So, Okay, so um, you know what, what have we learned from 20 years of distance learning? Uh, I won't go over this whole exhaustive list, it's not a very good way to provide information, but you know we've just learned a, a couple of interesting little tricks and there's probably more of these out there, but you know, we, we like for our instructors to be creative and to develop their own stuff. Uh, we want to try to use uh, a medium like this to promote engaging dialogue at a distance, and I hope being in the conference uh, you feel that that's the case. Um, we use a lot of learning management systems like Blackboard and Moodle. We leverage the web as much as possible using all the wide variety of stuff that's out there. And, and we want to then kind of stuff every channel that we can find. So, you know, we're going to um, publish a lot of our stuff on YouTube, any learning object repository we find, the iTunes, iTunes University. We basically want to put our stuff out there and just see through Darwinian selection, you know, which lives and which dies. And, and hopefully we'll be on, you know, we'll, we will uh, have have, I should say, um, we'll, we'll uh, have found a good horse to bet on in all these channels out here. And of course, we're building our own learning object repositories as well. Uh, we, we, of course, we look for independent students. We're, we're not opposed to actually like rolling out equipment. Um, in, the, in the aughts, uh, we got a, a big grant to build cyber campuses downstream. And I think that, well, the, the school right in the same county as Pasquotank High School, you know, Northeastern High, have you ever yes. been over to their distance learning room? Yes. Yeah, so we helped them build that and kind of figure out the kind of furniture that could be used. And we made these not only just um, like a receiving end for some of our content, but a place where students could come and work collaboratively on projects and, uh, and students could train teachers and, you know, kind of promote, technology, promote professional development throughout the school. Um, we try to, in, as much as possible, enrich distance learning with face-to-face -face experiences. I've been kind of reading the news lately and kind of trying to keep up with, you know, um, some of the trends in education, and there are a lot of online programs that are rolling out there in the state and across the country, and a lot of them have been criticized because they're not that engaging. Students just go on, do some reading, and, you know, do some homework, watch a few videos maybe, and then participate in a discussion board. and they're not engaged as much as they would be in a normal classroom. Well, we want to try to bring the level of engagement up to what something like a normal classroom. So what we do in our online program is even though our students are all around the state taking the course online, we try to bring them to a campus quite a bit. We, we bring them to campus in the summer. We use um, web conferencing frequently. That works a lot like video conferencing here, but it's more Skype-like um, to, to meet with the students as much as we can. So, um, and one thing that we've we've learned in our virtual labs is it's difficult for us to roll to like send an entire lab full of equipment out to a student at a distance so if we can't do that we'll try to bring them to campus as much as we can okay and if that doesn't you know if, they, if we can't bring them to campus enough we realize that the analytical work that they're doing is mm, almost as important maybe as using the physical tools that is you know um, you may 
in doing a, a lab, what's kind of what may be most important is is collecting the data and analyzing it, as well as learning how to use a pipette or a burette or um, you know a hot plate or whatever. Okay, so uh, let me show an example of that. Um, this is from our chemistry teacher um, who has developed some virtual labs that are provided not via animations but via video. This is Guido Gabrielli. Today we're going to do a magnesium hydrochloric acid lab. It's about three things. It's about verifying the molar relationship between the uh, magnesium and hydrochloric acid in terms of hydrogen gas produced. It is also about determining the volume of an ideal gas and determining the value of, the, uh, of R, the gas constant. Okay, so first we will tear the weighing boat. Now, one thing that's interesting about this lab is that the students have to collect the information themselves. Now, they, don't have, they can't afford an analytical balance, but we can do a little bit of the lab for them, and they'll collect that data and then use that in their computations. And as you can see here... Matches the atmospheric pressure outside. And now the two liquids are at the same level. Okay, so the student would then need to collect that little bit of data there. So, no, they didn't get their hands on, you know, the pipette or burette, and they didn't get their hands on the analytical balance, but they're doing all the work um, anyway. They're doing all the, the analytical work anyway. Okay, all right, so um, I'll talk about, like, one of my signature lessons, and we don't, we don't just invent everything here. We're not like, uh, there was that old phrase about Apple, you know, back in the 80s or something. If, it did, if Apple didn't invent it, they weren't going to use it, and they got, they got criticized for that. So I, you know, like to use other folks' resources as well and kind of remix it. And so this is a, a project that's put out by sciencecourseware.org, which is a collaboration between uh, Cal California State University uh, and the National Science Foundation. And it's basically a virtual fruit fly lab. Uh, I can't send flies out through the mail, and that takes two weeks to breed a whole generation anyway. So if I can do it virtually, uh, then we can go through a whole bunch of labs, a whole bunch of trials, and we can learn Mendelian genetics, you know, in just a couple of days. So the idea here is you go online, you choose your flies, you allow them to breed with one another, and then, you know, you look at them as if you were looking at them under an actual dissect dissecting scope. And I don't know if you guys remember doing genetics back in the day, but you look at the numbers of offspring and you use this to understand sort of the the, 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 tra the how the alleles are being inherited across the generations. So students will then uh, screen cap their results, put those into a lab notebook, and then send those back to me. So, um, it, it's a, so I, I like uh, using virtual labs quite a bit, and there's a lot of great stuff that's being put out by public television, Discovery Channel, all kinds of different university programs, other high schools like us, and um, you know, why should we reinvent the wheel if we can already find a couple things out there and sort of remix them for our own classes? And we, we want to share our stuff so other people can remix our stuff as well. Now, I have students send me stuff via screenshots. This is actually kind of useful. That button right there is, is neat, because when students are out there roaming around and doing stuff on the web, they can just take a quick screenshot of what they're doing, embed that into a Word document, and send that off to me. Some people get this confused uh, with screen recordings, and you'll see why I'm bringing this transition in a minute. Um, there are a variety of tools so that teachers, anything that they're doing online, they can capture really quickly. Um, and these tools are free. Um, that, this one software here, Camtasia Studio, it's a great tool and it's probably the most popular out there, but it, it costs $150 for one seat. But you can use Cam Studio, which is an open source version of that if you have like a Windows XP machine. If you have a nicer machine running Windows 7 or so, you can use Microsoft Expression Encoder, which will uh, not only capture video, but allow you to put it together in an entire um, sort of a, pa a Silverlight package. Uh, that's very uh, that's very interactive. Or if you're using a Mac, you can use Quick QuickTime Player. And um, I um, like to call this skill of a teacher that that wherein anything that they're doing on their computer, they can immediately create a video of it, asynchronous fluency. So, you know, here we teach. Uh, I'm teaching off a computer right now. I should be able to capture this on my computer and create a video in a hurry and then have that out to my students at a remote location. And a lot of teachers are doing this. I was just at, at a class, um, uh, at my leadership class a couple of nights ago, and a teacher who's on maternity leave was doing this and then uploading this to YouTube or a website. So uh, even though she had a sub, she could keep teaching 
a couple of important concepts that she didn't trust the sub to do uh, at a distance. So anyway, uh, one thing that I like to do since I teach biology and biology involves the relationship of structure and fun function at very small details, as you can see right. in some of my so, courses uh, here, um, I like to kind of zoom around. And so for all you teachers out here, here's a little bit of a trick. If you're teaching this way, you can save your PowerPoint as a PDF file and that'll enable you to zoom around and fly around inside it and, and take a good look at detail in the slide. So this is me talking. And uh, in interface. And that's me uh, talking as well. But, DNA is duplicated. So that's you know, one of my presentations. Now, um, let's see, by using these learning objects, these recorded presentations, uh, these uh, virtual, some of these virtual labs, but in creating a blended learning or a flipped classroom con uh, context, um, uh, our our teacher, uh, Mr. Gabrielli, has actually found uh, that some of his AP scores have actually been improving by uh, not spending so much time in class lecturing, but spending more of that time problem solving and doing labs and having the students watch the lecture after class when they can pause it, they can rewind it and back it up. Um, he's actually found that uh, it's been working out pretty well and his AP scores have been going up. So, you know, we're excited about this, this potential technique. Um, Let's see. Um, you know, I uh, would want to just share a couple of other signature lessons that, I, that I've been working on. This is one that exemplifies bringing a lot of stuff from a variety of sources and how it's been developed uh, by our colleagues to develop a great lesson. Uh, some of my students really like to hear the history of humanity, uh, how we all, uh, you know, uh, or how our ancestors were a small population of uh, humans living in Africa and then dispersed around the world over the past 60,000 years and we can trace that with DNA but they're always interested and they're of course interested in knowing how you actually trace that information with DNA how we can still see in our genomes today this in the, this information so I start out on my brain honey site which is our course website just you know allowing them to compare DNA sequences from different ethnic groups around the world um, and to look for unique markers and you know made this in you know 10 or 15 minutes and then um, uh, they then uh, take that and make simple family trees uh, that kind of resemble uh, these um, uh, that show uh, sort of divergence over time. Then we move on from humans to lemurs and one of the resources that we have nearby is the Duke Lemur Center where they have uh, these amazingly rare uh, lemurs but even if students at a distance can't get to there we show, I show videos and, and have uh, lots of other content to help them learn more about the lemurs and then they uh, download the lemur DNA uh, from uh, this uh, website here that the National Center for Biotechnology Information and then use uh, supercomputer programs to put these uh, lemurs into a phylogenetic tree. So this lesson actually was partially developed by me but also started by some of my colleagues and each of us have been taking it and, and updating it and sort of remixing it and then kind of moving it forward. So it's a signature lesson of multiple people. Um, another one uh, is uh, the Hominid Skull Lab. Um, I hosted a workshop where I bought a bunch of skulls uh, for uh, teachers to, who were interested in human history. And they, they kind of look like this one here I have uh, in my hand. I guess you can go to the full screen shot here, uh, Dan. And, um, uh, but these cost about $300 a piece and then I sent them out with all the teachers. By the way, that's a tip. If you want to have teachers come to your workshops, make sure that you send them home with something better than like bookmarks and pins and, and, and eraser stuff. Send them with some like good stuff like digital cameras and iPads and all that stuff if you can get it in your budget. But we sent them home with a bunch of stuff um, including like fossils from uh, out at the phosphate mines on the coast. But anyway, um, uh, so I realized that I had this great resource, as you can see on here on my computer, of all these skulls in one place, but they were all going to be dispersed. So I had uh, our photographer on campus take pictures of these uh, from a variety of different angles, and then he animated them in Flash. And so there's a lot of really great tools out there that make it easier to share things from the real world online. And these tools are getting easier and easier to develop. So now we can actually study hominid skulls virtually. And we've stored the skulls and a bunch of other pictures and animations in our learning object repository, uh, which I want to share with you. Uh, it's called STEM at NCSSM. And um, we've had a number of these efforts before, but we're kind of aggregating everything together. We're organizing it. Um, uh, Melissa is a... Uh, 
uh, uh, she was a librarian I'm way back in the day. Librarian. She's still a librarian way back in the day. Even the, <laughs> so, when you become a vice chancellor, you don't give up your librarian cr I, credentials. Librarian is your librarian for life now. Um, and and we have so much content. And every teacher, just like at your school, I'm sure your teachers have um, many different places that they like to um, put content up on the web, whether it's. Uh, um, wiki spaces or blogs or Google sites or any of those sites our teachers are just like that and they have stuff everywhere so we're trying to use the stem at NCSSM as a portal to launch out and to make searchable all this content we've got significant stem content in there math, lots of uh, secondary math and science content as well as a lot of other um, uh, odds and ends that we'll share with you a few of those uh, featured items and we just got started on this so right now it's primarily chemistry physics and then um, secondary mathematics so um, but we're bu we're building it yeah but and this would be the location where some of those aerospace engineering materials yeah, yeah. Would oh go. absolutely we will have a full-blown as we as we develop out the curriculum for the state in um, in applied sciences everything we create every every element of it and then whole modules so it might be like just a video or um, just an image or an applet or some sort of a little animation and you might just grab that piece and take it and run with it and do a lesson or put it into your online course or put it into your website that you have or you may use the entire module that we created a whole lesson or unit so and I'm going to talk a little bit later about how you know we're interested in collecting stuff from our partners to put up to feature and of course we realize that we're not the only game in town we take our stuff and put our stuff on YouTube and iTunes U and hopefully even if we work through those channels those channels will continue to attract people back to our site so um, <clears throat> the whole web is just a click away why not why not use it Okay, so let's see. Um, now, we uh, also just don't do STEM. Uh, we don't do STEM uh, types of blended learning or uh, flipped classroom. We actually have a music teacher who has found it's been really useful to provide basic music lessons to his students, and then they, the students can work on those on their own time, and then they'll come together and work together. Now, this is actually a bossa nova rhythm. I'll play the straight eight style for you. And I might pop a couple of little chromatic transitions in as well, so you can see what I might do if I was playing a bossa rhythm with a drummer. So he's got a drum on his laptop there. B flat. All right, so as you can see, um, he actually teaches violin, or he plays, well, I don't know, his number one instrument is violin, but he also plays the piano and the drums and the guitars, etc. And he, um, we have, you know, there's only two music teachers, and we've got a lot of students here at the School of Science and Math who teach music, and so this is a great way for those, those teachers to get a lot of their basic instruction kind of out of the way uh, offline. Um, all right, so um, <clears throat> I wanted to facilitate this discussion as much as we can about what makes a signature lesson because we not only want to feature those, but we want to feature yours as well. Um, do you, uh, let's see, is there any, I wonder if there's sure. anyone? I can, I mean, I, oh, can, go ahead. I can start a little bit. Um, you know, when I, when I was in the media center at the high school, um, I was uh, supporting every discipline at, at a very large high school. and. And so I saw what teachers were up against. And in some cases, they had to start from scratch to create their own lesson because A, the textbook didn't cover something in depth enough. It didn't line up with the state's curriculum. Perhaps they had um, a handful of students in their class who were struggling to um, effectively uh, understand a concept. So the lessons that they had used in previous years were insufficient. Um, sometimes they had an influx of students that were um, different learners. Perhaps they had always done something that was very visual and then they ended up with some people who were um, needed more hands-on. So there's a lot of reasons why people develop signature lessons and, um, and my observations over the years were that the people who did the most, um, you know, one of, the, one of the real key pieces is um, what is it that you geek out over? <laughs> like, what do you think, you know, is, is the reason why you study whatever you studied? So if you're a um, political science civics teacher, uh, my husband's a civics teacher, and he, um, he has been studying political science, and he has to teach economics, political science, as well as the legal system. But he is a political scientist, and he loves to 
the, you know, the American government topics and so forth. So he has created some lessons that put the students at the center of the activity because he just was mystified by why the students were not engaged when he was talking about like voting and how, how, how do we get the vote, the vote out because here, this is the, one of the most important things that you're going to do. You're going to become a contributing citizen now in the world. So don't you want to make sure you get the vote out? And so he would put the kids in that situation, do some problem solving, and his lessons were born of need because the kids were not engaged. And until you made it relevant to them, they did not get engaged. So, um, you know, I would argue that what makes a signature lesson to some extent is uh, is is just straight out need, you know, the mm -hmm. kids aren't getting it. So um, if anybody has any contributions um, that they'd like to put up in the chat window or if from our live audience, the uh, interactive audience, um, I'd love to hear from you. Now that we've been talking about it a little bit more, is there been a signature lesson in, in, your, um, in your aerospace science classes that where you can really leverage what your own experience is and this is what you can, you know, bring to the, the course that you really like teaching? Well, what I've been working at, I've, I've been trying to get an online ground school certification course. There's quite a few out what there. What was that? Grounds, grounds crew, correct? Grounds crew. Ground school. Ground school. Grounds. It's, it's a prerequisite for getting uh, your pilot's license. Oh, ground school. Okay. Ground school. So oh. before you even take off in the plane, you need to know, Absolutely. you need to have Absolutely. some mastery of everything. Well, I would there. hope so. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, there's a lot of programs out there, but again, under the parameter of, excuse me, under the umbrella of Junior ROTC, we have a lot of assets uh, that we have access to that are, are free and open to the school system as well. And as I mentioned before, there's several units out there, and I can't speak for any of the other units, but there's things that I've been trying to do since I've been here. And, and again, program isn't new. There's nothing new about what's going on. It's just, mm -hmm. again, finding that, that networking process of who I need to talk to and where, because I came here from Maryland and I was in close proximity to one of the local universities and I had my juniors and seniors matriculating at the junior and senior year right into the aviation program and we uh, had the same thing here uh -huh. and uh, as well as work with NASA oh, and they right. have a program K through 12. And oh, I had fifth okay. graders that could tell you anything about the planet of Mars. Uh -huh. So uh, again, we'll, we'll definitely talk offline because there's some things that we're trying to implement here in relation to that. And there is a curriculum in place now up in your area, but it's mm -hmm. individualized and specific to that school. Hmm. And I hadn't, have not had the opportunity to talk to those folks that had that program in place, but I have kind of ventured around. As a matter of fact, I just came back. I took some students to Singapore Wow. Uh, in November, December in the realm of aviation, but mm -hmm. they were junior ROTC cadets from four different states. Uh, so, so it's a matter of venturing out uh, but again, coming back to North Carolina, and again, you know, everybody may not want to be on board with it, but I'm, I'm looking for the students we have here because you're saying everything for, for, from what I've seen here is be definitely need-based. Uh, but we're trying to figure out a good starting point uh, to make that happen, but they have to have that background as well, that, that history. You know, one of our math teachers is actually a pilot and is... Uh does quite a bit of flying around. We always use him for aerial photos, so he might be someone to contact. Fabulous, um, fabulous. Crash, well, we will. Anyway, so, <laughs> so you see, these kind of conversations lead to these things absolutely. lead to more absolutely. conversations later offline. Get, get, get up with this via email. All right. I, I'm most certain, I'll probably be paying you a visit here shortly. Oh, That'd right. be awesome. Excellent. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I just wanted to talk about what we want to provide. I mean, we're going to keep teaching classes here at the university. Let's take, I mean, here at the school, let's take a look at our presentation. And we're also bringing in a diverse bunch of kids from around the state. As you can see here, they're all wearing their home school uh, colors. Uh, on our online program, we're going to roll out our learning object repository. We're going to keep doing video conferencing. If you want to know how to subscribe to NCSSM video conferencing courses, just take a look at our website. It's at uh, uh, www.com dlt.ncssm.edu and I will show you what that URL looks like right here. There it is. dlt.ncssm.edu and uh, you can click on interactive video conferencing. There's a, a video how it works. There's a course catalog and information about how to register. 
So we developed that on a school by school basis. Um, that is, uh, we might have two or three students at a particular school meet with us. We can usually meet with about four or five classrooms at a time, but um, even for schools who don't have the fancy vi distance, um, the video conferencing equipment that's used in distance education, the codex and, uh, and, and all that, with there are actually a, a number of clients um, that can connect to us via, or I should say students that can connect to us through uh, PC or even iPads. So mm -hmm. we're taking more singletons on in our courses as well as a small classroom full of students. So, okay, um, let's see, uh, moving on. Uh, of course, we're continuing to offer our summer programs, and we don't just want to like provide some professional development and then walk away. We want to develop relationships with people, and so this may involve some year-long collaborations for, to, um, to tie all these programs together and where some of our attendees might feed back into the system. So we have our Learning Option Repository that we've talked about, and we do have pretty ambitious goals. I mean, we want to reach a million students in North Carolina, and that includes, what was it? 100,000 teachers? 100,000 teachers and, uh, and a million students yeah. is the goal. And, and that's within the next five years. And in addition to that, which I think is even in some ways more audacious, we want to make sure that we have relationships with school systems, the majority of school systems in each of our 13 congressional districts. And so that requires somebody on the other end who we are in conversation with about what the needs are and trying to find ways that we can try to help improve outcomes for those school systems um, in addition to reaching individuals through our digital assets and our professional development courses. So, um, you know, we, we ultimately want to grow beyond North Carolina while recognizing, uh, of course, that uh, North, North Carolinians and their tax dollars are, are supporting all of our programs across the state. But we want to build local capacity, as Melissa mentioned, and we want to kind of promote this idea of open source education, which you've probably picked up, is that we think that educational resources should be freely available and people should have the opportunity to, you know, remix them in their own uh, creative ways while attributing the source of those. And we want to promote best practices practices for STEM because we realize, I mean, ultimately in the long term, the way that the state and the nation is going to emerge out of our current economic crisis, right? This long jobless recovery to um, uh, from this great financial crisis we had a few years ago is to innovate, you know, to develop new types of industries, uh, develop um, uh, and that's going to require uh, lots of students who uh, are trained in um, STEM education. So. Um, Finally, uh, we're just going to ask anyone out there, what can your NCSSM do for you? That is, what can we do for you as your statewide uh, science and um, math and technology school? Or what can organizations like ours do for you? What are your needs? And we've, we've heard um, from uh, and folks I have on a, site. Yeah, and I have a question um, that's been raised in the stream, which is, um, are you just focusing on the high school level? And um, what we have been doing is we have been providing professional development in all of secondary. So we have, you know, I, I think that with our math and, uh, and essential standards trainings and a lot of the work that we do with teachers that we could be working with teachers in upper elementary through middle school um, and then into the high school. As far as creating curriculum materials, we do primarily focus in the high school region of uh, the curriculum because that is where we live. Um, however, we do enrichments with our um, younger children. These uh, enrichments are either, there's a number of different ways these are delivered. And this is something that we're working on trying to improve. When we first started with the video conferencing, we were providing uh, enrichments it live like this where people could, you know, the students in the classroom can interact with the presenters. Sometimes the presenters are faculty, sometimes there's, they're, they're young, there are high school students and they would do activities with elementary kids. Um, we're also looking at, at, at modifying that model so that we can reach more kids because a lot of people don't have access to video conferencing and so we want to make sure that we use um, web conferencing software for some of this delivery and also create some digital materials so if you if you contact us and say you know what my kids are struggling with this particular strand of mathematics and I'm a fourth grade teacher that's the feedback we need we need to know where what's hard to teach what do you wish you had access to and and so 
elementary materials we can create as well, but we need better information from the field about sort of how we need to ramp up our services for younger children. So um, that's something that I would strongly recommend that if you are working at a younger level, that you would contribute by um, telling us what kinds of topics you wish that you had access to um, more robust learning materials and let us uh, start working on that for you. So, and uh, let me share with you our contact information so that if you have any questions afterwards, um, we'd be glad to address those. As Melissa mentioned, you know, we have some ideas about how to um, leverage the strengths we have here uh, among our faculty, um, but we're always eager to grow and, and try to solve problems that we haven't yet anticipated out there from the state of North Carolina and, and, and abroad. So if there's any other questions or any follow-up, um, Well, thank you for um, sharing uh, your afternoon with us. <laughs> and um, uh, like I said, we're really looking forward to establishing new partnerships for uh, the 21st century. All right, looking forward thank to you. hearing from you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, take bye -bye. care.